going to go ahead and get started. I'm, um, I'm Ann Marburger. I'm the executive director of Padres Pedal the Cause. Um, it's great to see several familiar faces here tonight and to see a lot of new faces. Um, I just want to start by giving a very big thank you to John and Sally Hood. Not only for hosting this beautiful gathering tonight, but for really believing in Padres Pedal the Cause um, and for taking an active role in helping us support cancer research in San Diego. Um, so we have an exciting program lined up tonight. We're going to hear from two leaders who have dedicated their professional career and their lives to um, cancer research. Uh, Ezra Cohen, who's at Moore's Cancer Center, um, and John Hood, who's going to tell us a little bit about the drug that he discovered that just got approved a few weeks ago and is currently treating patients, which is awesome. Um, before that, I'd like to take just a few minutes to share an overview of what Padres Pedal is as an organization um, for people who are new to our community. So um, Padres Pedal the Cause is committed to accelerating cures for cancer by funding the best and brightest collaborative research in San Diego. Um, San Diego is unique. There are three NCI designated cancer centers, so Moore's Cancer Center, the Salk Institute, and Sanford Burnham Prebis, and then we have a top-rated children's hospital, which is Rady Children's. Um, so the pedal community exists to fund collaboration among those four institutions. I mean, we fund collaboration because we believe bringing together basic scientists with clinical researchers sparks new ideas, and that bringing together technologies and resources to fight the most complex cancers can only accelerate the discovery of cures. So over our first six years, um, we raised just over $10 million, which has funded 54, thank you, that's great, um, 54 translational research grants and five clinical trials. Um, so from a research perspective, um, we have some good data to share. Um, we just uh, did a study to look at the projects that we funded in our first um, four years. So from 2014 to 2017, I guess that's three years, um, we provided an initial investment of about two and a half million dollars. And we found that those projects went on to gain an additional $32 million in external funding. So for every dollar we provided, those projects were going on to get an additional $14, which is awesome. Um, from a care perspective, uh, we funded five clinical trials for the first time in 2018, and we already have, there are already 25 patients collectively enrolled across those clinical trials. Um, oftentimes those patients are people who have no other options, and it's their last um, kind of course of treatment to try and fight cancer. So we're making a big impact um, on those individual patient lives and certainly on their families. So that's a little bit about the impact of Padre's Pedal. Um, we also like to have fun, uh, as this party this evening shows. Um, we have a big celebration coming up in November uh, at Petco Park. It's Saturday, um, November 16th. And if you're new to the community, um, it's really a day to celebrate and to take action and to, s to support local research. So um, there are four cycling routes that we, that we do. They all go over the Coronado Bridge, ranging from 25 to 100 miles. I can see some people smiling as if they would never touch 100 miles. Um, there are some people here that do that. So if you're interested, um, you can ask one of them. Uh, we also have spin classes on the field. If you don't want to get on a bike uh, but you're ready to spin, you can do that. And we have a 5K um, family-friendly walk-run um, and a kids challenge. So all roads uh, kind of come into Petco Park and there's a big celebration with live music and entertainment on the field afterwards. So um, our hope is that everyone here finds a way to participate and join uh, one of the teams. I know Sally and John participated last year and, and there are several people here as well. So um, in a couple minutes, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cohen to, to share a little bit about the clinical trial that we funded. Um, and you're going to love him. Um, so probably mixing a little bit of tequila with a speech from Ezra Cohen, you're going to leave here thinking that he should run for president uh, in 2020, which you would have my vote. I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, but I just have one ask um, before I turn it over to Dr. Cohen, and that is that if you're inspired by the numbers uh, and the impact that our organization has had, and you're inspired by what you hear from Ezra and John, that you just take a second to introduce yourself to, to me or to our staff over here, Shannon, Megan, and Dustin. Um, we would love to share more information about how you can get involved. We've made four very simple ways um, to get involved, ranging from riding a check to riding uh, a bicycle on event weekend. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Cohen. Um, he doesn't like when I call him that. He insists on Ezra. But if you did your homework and you read the article that I shared, you, you know about Dr. Cohen that he is pushing the boundaries of cancer research and that he will not accept the standard of care as of chemotherapy and radiation and insists that personalized medicine and immunotherapy is the way forward. Um, we are proud to have funded Dr. Cohen. We funded a clinical trial um, that was obviously covered in the article, but he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Um, he also rides and participates every year in the event. So if you don't want to support his campaign for presidency, you can uh, donate to his fundraising. Um, but with that, I would love to introduce Dr. Cohen. He's going to take a couple of questions at the end. So if you have questions that you want to ask of him, feel free to do that. Thank you, Ann. Thanks. And uh, Megan, if you can just cue the music, that would be great. We'll get, uh, we'll get right to it. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, uh, so I was not born in this country, don't worry, I cannot run for president, so uh, you're off the hook for, for that. Um, and uh, first I, I want to start by thanking everybody for, uh, for coming. Thank you to John and Sally, you're probably somewhere out there uh, for hosting this in your uh, beautiful home and the support for Pedal. Um, I, I want to tell you a whole bunch of stories uh, to really encapsulate um, how we've gotten to this point with respect to cancer research and the programs that we're, um, uh, that we're taking forward. Uh, it'll start with the story, a personal story of why I came here. And um, it, uh, believe it or not, started in India. Um, I was uh, speaking at a meeting and uh, there happened to be another uh, faculty member who was from UCSD. And he told me that they had just recruited uh, Scott Lipman to be the Cancer Center Director. And I said, uh, wow, Scott's been trying to recruit me down to Houston for about a decade. And I finally told Scott, not in a million years am I going to move to Houston. For those of you who are from Houston, I'm sorry, but it's way too humid. Uh, way too humid. <laughs> Uh, but then I said, but you know, San Diego, that could be attractive. Uh, and that was purely based on uh, the little I, ha I knew at that time about uh, San Diego. So sure enough, I got a phone call two weeks later from Scott. Uh, hey, Ezra, do you want to come have a look at a job here? And uh, I ca uh, so finally I came down. It took a, a couple of months to arrange. And I have to tell you the truth. I was not impressed uh, the first time I came. And I uh, called Scott back and I said, you know, Scott, uh, I don't think this is for me. Things are going pretty well at the University of Chicago. We've got a good program. He said, you know what? Come down one more time. Meet with a different group of people and tell me if you feel the same way. Came down again about a month later and I met with uh, some exceptional world-class uh, scientists don't know why I didn't meet them the first time around, but you know, we, you can ask Scott that question. Um, and uh, they, they gave me, uh, they left me with two thoughts. Um, one, the incredibly collaborative atmosphere uh, that we have here. Um, and I, I felt like either they were all on the same drug and brainwashed or the collaboration and, and that culture was ingrained in the San Diego community. Found out later that, it, in fact, it is part of the culture here. And most importantly, and I remember uh, calling um, uh, somebody at the time and, and saying these exact words, we're going to change the world in San Diego. I felt that five and a half years ago, and I still feel that now. The intellectual energy, the biotech that many of you are part of, uh, the resources that we can bring to bear are going to change the world with respect to cancer research. Uh, and what we needed to do at that time was to galvanize the efforts, bring people together even more, and begin to translate this incredible basic science into clinical science and into uh, directions for patients. So I ended up accepting Scott's offer and, and uh, fortunately uh, um, uh, took a faculty position at, at UCSD. A few months after that, I'll tell you another story. Uh, I, uh, somebody named Ralph Whitworth, who some of you uh, might know, uh, gave me a call. Uh, unfortunately, he had developed metastatic head and neck cancer and, and that's one of the cancers maybe the cancer that, that I um, would consider uh, myself uh, somewhat knowledgeable in. And uh, we had a long conversation about um, 
how Ralph uh, could be treated and the options for therapy and immunotherapy was just coming into play at, at that point. And uh, we ended the conversation by him saying, well, you know what? Uh, I want to come see you. Where are you? I said, well, right now I'm in Chicago, but in two weeks I'm moving to San Diego. And he said, I live in San Diego. When, when can we make this happen? And sure enough, we ended up, uh, he ended up uh, becoming a patient. But more than that, we had a very important conversation uh, at the Morris Cancer Center Cafe uh, where he asked me, uh, after we talked about for about an hour around immunotherapy and what was going on. And remember, this was five years ago, so, so things still hadn't really uh, come to the fore. And uh, he asked a very simple question. How do we make this happen? How do we accelerate it? And I was quite frank with him, and I said, we need money. Uh, we need resources. If, you, if we want this to move fast, we can't depend on the NIH. NIH is a wonderful funding source, but it's slow. And quite honestly, I see some people nodding their heads, uh, quite honestly, it funds, I hate to say this, but mediocrity. We, we are re the recipient of a lot of NIH funding, so it's, it's not uh, uh, that, that we don't apply, but it is slow and it doesn't fund high-risk uh, projects. And so I said, we need resources, and his response was, without hesitation, I can make that happen. And through him and through the Immunotherapy Foundation, we began a cancer immunotherapy program here at Moore's with the idea that we were going to move fast, we were going to bring things to patients, and we were going to be cutting edge. So then I had a conversation with an immunologist at uh, La Jolla Institute, and I remember this, this uh, distinctly because we drew this on his whiteboard, and we began to think about the realities of cancer and immunotherapy. And there's one... There are two realities that, that came to us uh, uh, very quickly. The first is that every cancer is different, and for those of you who are in the sequencing or the diagnostics realm for, uh, for cancer, you know what I mean. Even though two cancers may look alike uh, uh, under the microscope, they may have started in the same place, so two patients may have breast cancer. When we do sequencing on those cancers, we now understand that they are two different cancers at a molecular level. We felt that we couldn't ignore that biology. What cancer was telling us was that every single patient, every single cancer was in fact different. And we've known for a long time that our immune systems respond differently to different antigens. So everybody's immune system is different. And we felt like if we would continue to ignore those two basic elements of malignant disease, we were never going to take the big leaps forward in terms of cancer therapy. And so we decided to embark on a project that would define what a person's immune system was responding to and create therapies based on that. But if you're following what I just said, you're realizing that what we're talking about is making a treatment for one person on Earth, one person at a time. So not necessarily the big pharma paradigm uh, and not necessarily something that you might be able to sell uh, to investors uh, because the business development uh, path is not as clear as with, let's say, a small molecule or an antibody or a drug that you can literally apply to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. But that's what the biology was telling us. And if we continue to ignore the biology, we truly felt that we weren't going to take those next big leaps forward. So fast forward a few years, and if you read the story uh, in the Union Tribune uh, last week, you already know this, but um, uh, about two months ago, I was walking to my office, and uh, Tina Sacco, who's another medical oncologist at our institution, uh, her office is two doors uh, from mine, she had uh, her door open, and I, I walked by, and she saw me walking by, she said, Ezra, Come into my office. I, I think I need to put this down. Um, uh, uh, don't let me forget it because it's really good tequila. Um, so she said, uh, uh, Ezra, come into my office. And I go, uh, uh, what's going on? She goes, take a look at these scans. This is from the patient that we just treated on your personalized vaccine study. And there was a 90% reduction in all his tumors. And I couldn't believe it. I, I said, are you sure? 
you're looking at the right scans? Uh, this is, I looked, I checked the dates. In fact, they corresponded with the therapy. Uh, they were indeed the right scans. This is a 43-year-old man with four kids and uh, was going to die of his disease. He was refractory to chemotherapy. He was refractory to targeted uh, therapy. He got on the vaccine and he's feeling great. His life has come back to him. He's able to play with his kids. He's back at work. And it makes us truly believe that what we're doing is on the right path. But in order to treat that gentleman um, with all the success inherent in that story, his vaccine costs about $120,000. Every vaccine we make for every individual costs about $120,000. Now, those costs will come down. I know uh, some of you may be thinking, well, that's impossible. How are you going to scale that? Those costs will come down just like your first laptop came down in cost, your first mobile phone came down in cost and got better over time. Technologies get less expensive as time goes by. And so we realize that we'll eventually uh, get it to a price that's viable for a large number of people um, but right now, in order to do the initial discovery, it costs a lot of money. But it's worth it because here's a gentleman who's got his life back and his kids and his wife have their husband and their father back. I don't know how long the response is going to last. Uh, we still have to define that. It's early days. Um, but the fact that something's happening in the right direction tells us that we're going on the right path and that the science is uh, giving us that opportunity. So let me tell you another secret or let me tell you a secret and that is um, that I'm actually really not that smart. Um, uh, maybe, maybe you guys already knew that. Um, and the key to success for me throughout my career has been uh, finding incredibly smart collaborators and working with them. And that's exactly what I've been able to find here at, uh, in San Diego. And many of you already know this. You're already in the field. You're in, you're in the industry. You're in academics. Um, what we have here in San Diego is something that I think the rest of the nation and maybe even the rest of the world has not woken up to. Um, we have, uh, in my opinion, the most robust and um, uh, 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 energetic scientific community uh, in the world uh, and, and, and certainly in the United States. Um, and, and the key to it is that we're collaborative. Um, it's UCS, it's not just UCSD, but it's UCSD, it's La Jolla Institute, it's the Salk, it's the Sanford Burnham, it's Scripps Research, it's the uh, biotech community that, that depending on how you want to uh, do the stats, either the largest biotech cluster in, in the U.S. or the third largest biotech cluster in the U.S. It's the resources that we can bring to bear. Um, and we can make things happen and we can change the world and we will change the world. Um, so the key, in my opinion, or in, in my mind, to our success is really um, the collaborative uh, community that we have here. It's the reason I came and it's the reason that we've been so successful. I'll leave you with one more story, and it's one that um, I, I view with hope and I look at the future, and, and some of you have, have already heard this. Um, about a year ago, maybe two years ago, I was um, getting on an airplane, and uh, behind me, where I was flying back to San Diego, and behind me was a mother and her two kids. And uh, we were held up in line, uh, and so I turned around and began talking uh, to this family. They were from uh, Poway, and uh, the, uh, we were really held up in line, so it turned into a longer conversation than we anticipated, and um, started talking to her kids. And, and her eight-year-old daughter um, asked me, well, what do you do? And I said, I'm an oncologist. I'm a, I treat cancer. She looked at me, uh, you know, quizzically and, and uh, uh, didn't really, it was clear that she didn't really know what that was. And I said, uh, uh, cancer is, is a disease and, and, that's, and that's what I treat. But it left me with a really great thought in a way. Here was an eight-year-old girl 
And uh, it may be the first time that she ever heard that word. It didn't, it didn't strike fear into her. She, didn't, she, hadn't, she never heard of, of cancer and never was worried about cancer. And isn't that where we want cancer to be? We want to be able to say the word and it not be a fearful term because we want to be at a place and we will be at this place in the near term, in our generation, in our lifetimes, where somebody hears the word cancer, you've got cancer, and they say, okay, I know how to treat it, I know how to cure it, and it's something that I'm gonna get over. It may not be easy, I may need to take uh, treatment for a little while, but it's not gonna kill me. The last, our last generation of medical practitioners uh, really, in effect, cured or controlled heart disease. Cancer is now the number one killer in San Diego County. I was just told, actually, last week that it is now the number one killer in the United States. We need to change that. We can change that. And we can get to a point where the next generation, and we owe this to the next generation, where the next generation hears that word and isn't frightened by it. And I think we can do that. But what do we need to do that? We need collaboration. We need um, intellectual energy, and we need resources. And through organizations like PEDAL, um, we've been able to raise, uh, as, as Anne said, 10 million, is it now, over, over this uh, time period. 100% of that goes to research. 100% of that goes to moving the field forward so that we can be at that point. So I've spoken for long enough. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your support. And uh, we agreed that I would take a couple of questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Did I go to the Rolling Stones concert? Yeah. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was pretty amazing. Uh, Faye, are you in the room still? Somewhere? I can't see because of the light. But uh, yeah, thanks, Faye, to, to, uh, to that. Yeah, yeah. Mick Jagger was 72 at the time. He played for an hour and a half, didn't stop. It was amazing. I, I, I actually can't see if arms are up, so just go ahead and, and scream. Uh, the, the light's uh, in my eyes. How can you contribute tonight? Um, so uh, ride. Uh, would be amazing. Join uh, join pedal as a as a rider. Uh, I do uh, a lot of these bike rides. I've done uh, the MS ride. I've done the diabetes one. I've done uh, the AIDS rides when they used to have those. Uh, if you're a cyclist, uh, pedal will be the best event that you'll attend. It is the best organized. Um, it is uh, the most fun event um, that that you will that you will ride as a cyclist. If you're not a cyclist, uh, you will love it. It's so much fun, the spirit is wonderful, and um, the best way you can support us is become a rider, uh, raise money for the cause, uh, get other people involved. If you just hate physical activity, and you just can't think about getting on a bicycle, or getting on a spin bike, or walking uh, 5K, then um, you can volunteer, or you can contribute. Uh, everything helps, everything counts, and um, we, we need it. Yes, sir. The, uh, the cancer vaccine, the personalized cancer vaccine you described, is there an opportunity that, <coughs> that patients will share similar uh, uh, you know, needs and, and there'll be some ability to utilize that against other patients? Uh, yeah, so, so if I can rephrase the question about the personalized cancer vaccine, are there gonna be similarities between patients that we can use going forward? Did I rephrase that uh, uh, correctly? And, and the answer is yes. So um, what was the first thing that was fascinating to us was that every patient responds to their cancer. Um, we didn't realize that when we started. So when we began to think about neoantigens, so neo being new, antigen is what the immune system responds to, we didn't know what, how the immune system was going to, uh, what was the immune system was going to tell us. But what it tells us is that what it was, and it continues to tell us, is that every patient's immune system actually has a response against their cancer. We can detect it, and it's against multiple neoantigens, consistently every patient that we've seen. 
The other thing that we've noticed is that not all mutations, and, and the neoantigens are produced because of mutations. Cancer is a disease of mutations. Um, not all mutations um, are equal in the eyes of the immune system. We began to understand that there are certain mutations, especially something we call frame shifts, um, that are very immunogenic. The immune system likes to respond to those types of mutations. And so we began to build that into how we identify neoantigens. And I can tell you at this point that if I see a certain mutation in a cancer, I can bet you 90% that that's going to turn out to be a neoantigen um, that, that the immune system has, has responded to. And so now we can begin to use that information and say, okay, well, now we can pick a few that we know we're going to put in the vaccine because we've seen this over and over again, and then maybe some others that are going to be individualized to that uh, specific person. And you can begin to think about constructing the vaccine based on a hybrid of off the shelf and truly individualized. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and that's what that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I should have said, thank you for asking. Um, uh, the entire program has been funded by um, some form of philanthropy one way or the other. So be it the Immunotherapy Foundation, uh, be it the, the Strausses or the Peabody's, and now uh, Petal, um, the entire program is uh, funded by philanthropy, and uh, there is no cost to the patient. Uh, so this is all... Uh, fortunately, um, uh, provided essentially free of charge. So, um, so the patient's uh, economic health is not an issue uh, whatsoever. Uh, so, yeah, we're that 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 we can right now, and I hope forever, because ethically I think that's the right thing to do. Uh, take that out of the equation. Yeah. 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 You're talking about the vaccine, right? Yeah. So, uh, so the question for those of you who haven't heard, what's what's the real driver of the cost? Um, is that is that am I rephrasing it correctly? Um, it's it's uh, the vaccine manufacturer uh, right now. So, um, uh, sequencing is now really affordable. It's it's about a thousand to two thousand uh, dollars. Uh, so another example of a technology that has come down uh, several logs in, in price as it gets uh, uh, adapted. Uh, the first genome cost about a million dollars to, to sequence. Uh, now we can do it for about a thousand. Um, so, uh, so that's pretty routine. The, um, the calling of the neoantigens, which is a T-cell functional assay, Happy to talk about that more if you're interested. Um, uh, that takes uh, about two weeks, but only costs a few thousand dollars. The real cost is is vaccine manufacture because uh, I inherently we're starting from scratch every single time. Uh, we are creating a new product uh, for every individual. Having said that, we can still scale that down by increasing manufacturing efficiency and capacity uh, to the point where I... I We've worked out these numbers. Uh, we can probably get it down to somewhere in the range of about twenty to thirty thousand. We're not going to get it down to the price of a small molecule. This is not going to be a few dollars. That that just is not realistic. Um, but if but to put it into perspective, uh, pembrolizumab or Keytruda, which is approved um, for multiple cancers now, I think it's about a dozen. That's about fifteen thousand dollars a dose, and it's dosed every three weeks. Uh, so if we can bring the vaccine down to that thirty thousand uh, price point and we can cure cancer with it, I, I think that's worth it. Okay, I guess that's my cue. Uh, thank you very much. John, I think you're up, right? Okay, I, I have no introduction. That's all good. <laughs> yeah, most of these guys know me, so it's fine. Okay, thank you for, you were kidding, Ezra, it's really blinding. Um, thanks for coming out, guys. You you came out on a school night. I really appreciate it. And you came out to talk uh, to hear about pedal. So I'm going to talk about pedal more than fed radnib. Um, there's a few things I wanted to highlight about why I ask all of you to be here. 
why I think the San Diego biotech community should be aware of this particular charity. It's exceptional, and I'll explain what I mean by that. It actually is an integral part of the San Diego biotech ecosystem, even though it's not being necessarily recognized. And it's really, really easy to contribute and be a part of it. And lest my wife kill me, I'll keep it short because there's a buffet after this and you'll be able to eat. So what do I mean by exceptional? We've all been touched by cancer in our lives one way or the other. We've had loved ones or other ones pass away. My mom, my brother, two days ago, my dog, all sorts of things. You know, Cancer strikes all of us. And in a few really unusual cases, the patients step up and make a difference. And with in Fedradnib, now in Rebic, my last company, that happened when a drug discovered, developed, funded locally, went on, did very well in treating a disease, it was taken away from the patients, and the patients said no. And they reached out, and they identified people that could help get it back, and that was a drug that was approved by the FDA about three weeks ago now. It's, it's treating patients. I know patients personally who are alive today because of that drug. That was a thank you. That was a San Diego discovery that's becoming a San Diego cure. And that's very much what Pedal's working on. And how Pedal can be part of that ecosystem. Well, let me back up. Let me tell you a little bit about Pedal. I don't know if Bill likes to share the story. So the way Pedal started is once again one of those patients stepping up. Bill Coleman was in St. Louis. He was diagnosed with a form of lymphoma. It was treated there, worked for a while, came back, needed a bone marrow transplant, came out to San Diego to get that. And it worked well, and he's, he's just doing fantastic. But treatment for cancer isn't easy. Bone marrow transplants are harrowing. They're horrible treatments. And the reason we talk about cancer is because not only is it an insidious disease, but the therapeutics for it right now are not very good in many cases. So Bill and Amy stepped up. They found a way to do better. They formed Pedal to create funds so the next patients don't necessarily have to do that. They have another choice. That was the whole goal of this. And it can be a key part of the San Diego biotech ecosystem. And that's why I wanted all of this particular group to be here because what they're funding is not esoteric. They're funding things through the valley of death. They're taking really innovative therapies and go, doing the translational work, doing the clinical trials, it wouldn't, wouldn't be funded by the NIH. Ezra was being very kind. There's no way that would be funded by the NIH. And it wouldn't be funded by VCs. But if he gets proof of concept, if it works, then suddenly that becomes a San Diego community. That's, that's, that's filling up a, a biotech incubators, that's filling up buildings, that's creating a pharmaceutical product that we can take to patients. So Pedal is fairly unique. I always used to sort of say, God, I hope they treat all these diseases soon because I'm tired of running 5Ks. This is not that. This is a lot more. This is genuinely taking drugs or taking innovative therapies from San Diego, from the innovators, translating them, putting them into clinical trials, and hopefully they work in patients, and if they do, they can become companies. There's a dead spot, a black hole there in San Diego, and Pedal is filling that. And they're incredibly capital efficient, too. I was actually, I, I think one of the reasons they're capital efficient is Bill and Amy are so nice. They get guys like me and Rich Heyman and all these others to work for free. And Ezra, I already, I brought up to your partner, that, that's as capital efficient as possible. Hey, you know something, work for free. Uh, we can get Monsef Salute from GSK. I was talking to Charlie about that earlier. He's got, I think, eight vaccines on the market right now, more than any other human being on the planet. He ran vaccines at GSK. If your stuff works, we'll get him. And now that I said it out loud, I'm sure Amy and Bill will make sure we get him. <laughs> this is a great cause. And as to the question of what you can do, Go to this table, talk to them. It's as simple as the easiest thing is writing a check to help fund it. But the event at Petco is really, really fun. You go to, down on the field. You can just do a spin class with Tony Gwynn Jr. You can run a 5K. You can do a 25-mile bike ride. You can do a 100-mile bike ride. The main thing is you get people to donate, and you bring money to guys who are actually going to create new therapies. Personally, I'm probably just going to bike to the Hotel Dell, put the bikes in the back of my truck, and then go back to Petco next year. It doesn't matter. 
The point is you're part of the process, you're raising money. Anne and her crew can help tell you how to do that. So once again, it's a school night. I'm not gonna talk any longer. Please talk to these guys about what to do. This charity actually does help. It will create new drugs, which will help the entire San Diego Biotech. San Diego Cures for San Diego patients. It can all happen here. Thank you guys.